Good morning. Good morning once again to all of our viewers and everyone present here in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a beautiful Sunday morning uh, to come together and to sit and study God's word. This morning, uh, we want to pray for the absence of our pastor, Pastor Norman and his wife. Uh, they're at home uh, sick right now with the COVID. So we want to, uh, as we open up in prayer, we also want to pray for them. Father God, we just thank you for another beautiful day. We thank you for the power of your word, Father God, your grace and mercy, O oh God. And, and we come before you, Heavenly Father, to the throne of grace and mercy, asking you, O oh God, that if we've done anything, Father God, that would hinder this prayer, we plead the precious blood of Jesus, Father God, that's able to cleanse us from any and all unrighteousness. Now we come to you on behalf of Pastor Norman and his wife, O oh God. We pray healing in, in their bodies, Father God, a quick recovery, Father God. Strengthen their bodies as we speak right now, Father God, and stand in agreement, Father God, on your word. And we thank you and we love you, O oh God. And as we prepare to study this lesson in Revelations, the second chapter, verse two and three, O oh God, we ask through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, O oh God, that you help us, Father God, direct us in the way we, we you would have us to go, Father God. So then as you're doing it, Father God, and everything is over with, there will be nothing left that was missing or lacking. We thank you, we love you, and we give you the glory that you so rightfully deserve in the name that's above every name. And at the name of Jesus, let his people say, Amen. Revelations, the second chapter, it says, verse 2 and 3, and it reads, it says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have tested them. I'm going to read that again. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Verse 3, and you have pers persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Mm. That church there was doing a good work. He said, you've done these things, and, all, and in doing all these things, you have not become weary. And then the scriptures also tell us, be not weary in well-doing, and if we be not become weary, we shall receive the promise. It talks about here in the lesson, it says, the church, the believers in the church, God was, in this lesson, verse 2 and 3, there is the com commendation. The church is commended for five significant things. Number one, the church was commended for the church work and labor for Christ. The work and labor that they were doing for Christ. Not for man, not for manna, not for anything else first. Because the Bible says, God says, well, the first commandment is to love the Lord. So we don't put no one before God, nothing before God. So their first thing that they were doing, they said the church worked and labored for Christ. So why did they first work and labor for Christ? We have to ask ourselves. Well, I was talking to Brother uh, Ed this morning, and we were talking about that, and we said our first obligation has to be to the Lord. And if it's to the Lord, the work that we do, 
when we come into the church or we're out in the community or in our marriage or whatever it may be in life that we're doing, it has to be on to God first. And if I do it as on to pleasing my father first and then what I'm doing for her, him first and then whatever I do for you, then it's going to be done from a right heart, from good motives. And so that's why their first obligation was to Christ. But they had to have a relationship. We have to have a relationship with him in order to feel conviction about the things we're doing for him or the things when we do that's not right. In other words, in Psalms 51, David Remember when David prayed and David said, uh, Father, I sinned, and against you have I sinned and done this evil. He said, against you first. Wait a minute, David. You went and you messed with another man's wife, and you got her pregnant. But the first thing when you prayed, you prayed to God and you said, against you because it was personal, because what you do to that person, you do to the Lord first. See, because you carry, we carry our Father's name. We're, repre we're representatives of our Father. When we're saved, blood bought, he paid a price. He paid a price for our sins, for the sins of the world. And once we give our life to Christ, then we carry, we no longer carry our name we carry our father's name so when we go out in the world we're representatives of our father first of all and so we can either be good representatives or poor representatives we can represent him in a poor way but if we have a relationship even if we're lacking in some areas we'll clean those areas up why will we clean those areas up because all of a sudden now those areas when we go in and we do what we shouldn't do like David, his heart was convicted. So when David, when, when uh, God sent the man to speak to David, Nathan, and told him the, a scenario, a story, and he said, well, what do you think about an individual like this? And he said, that man deserves death. And he said, David, you that man. And David's heart was convicted. And David was king. And show you why David had a relationship and his heart was so convicted. Because he was king and he could have continued to try to cover it up. Because he was king. And could, he could have said, you know what? What you just said to me ain't getting no further out of this room. You dead. That's it. You gone. But he didn't do that. Immediately, conviction hit him because God, grace and mercy, he sent someone there to speak to him for him to clean this up. Because when God does something, when he says, despise not the chastising of the Lord because the ones he loved, he corrected. God loves us so much, he don't want us to stay in these areas of our sin and of our shortcoming. So if he has to send help to us, someone to speak to us, and if we have that type of relationship, then conviction is going to set in. And so even more in the church, they were doing a good work, but they were doing a good work because they understood they had a relationship with the Lord, and they understood that, hey, first of all, I'm doing this for my father. So I'm not getting caught up into what people say about me. I'm not getting caught up into, I'm not getting a pat on the back. I'm not getting uh, uh, caught up into, uh, uh, I'm not getting no money out of this. I'm not getting, because the Lord said, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. He said, I'll meet every one of your needs according to the riches of my glory. God will take care of your needs. He said, but just be about my business seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then the things you can't fix I'll fix I'm a God of perfect order so they were about their father's business and so that's why they prospered and so let's read on here it says the Greek and the uh the Greek kepo k 
kepon, I can't pronounce that, means to labor. Here's what they were doing. It means to labor to the point of weariness, sweat and exhaustion, to work and labor to the limit of one's ability, to work and labor to the limit of one's ability, to the ability that God has given you. The church was working, was a working church. It was a working church. It wasn't a perfect church, but it was a working church. A laboring church, a church committed, uh, listen here, a church that was committed to serve Christ and to serve him to the fullest. They were committed. Like in the book of Acts, when they came together with one common denominator for the glory of God, and they were committed to serve Christ and to serve him to the fullest. And so if there were any lacking areas, when God sent help, someone to speak to them, or God spoke to them through the Holy Spirit, or however God dealt with them, when they, he dealt with them about areas that they were lacking, then they didn't get mad and say, look all this I'm doing and then you bothering me about this? Don't you see all these other things? I'm tired. You know, I've been on the battlefield for you and da 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 and now you hit me with this? They didn't do that right there. They looked at those areas because they knew that Christ had their best interest in mind. And when you know, and when you know through a relationship that someone has your best interest in mind, there's going to be times that they're going to say things that might hurt your feeling. But look at here. The Bible says, fight the good fight of fate, and then it says the mind is the battlefield. So if you know that, if you know that that person that's coming to you and saying something to you that might be hurtful or areas that you know you need to clean up, and they say it to you, now when the enemy comes and he try to bring a thought, look at this, all the stuff you're doing over here, and they got the audacity to come to you and say something like that to you, you know, and they supposed to be your friends. A friend wouldn't do anything like that. You know, now you have something to fight back with because now, see, you have something in your head that can say that, you know what, I know Brother Ed really cares for me. I know because I know because I know the tree by the fruit that is bearing. I know that's a healthy tree. I know that person really has my best interest in mind. And the only reason that they're telling me that I need to get this together is not to make me bitter, but to make me better. See, because they don't want me to be complacent. They don't want me to stay because they see the real person. They see uh, the potentials that I have in me and they will not allow me to settle for less. So they put a demand on the things that God called me to. So if God called you over here, then he puts a demand on them. Just like the disciples when he worked with them. When he worked with those 12 men, and I'd always say, well, 11, because one uh, 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 re did what he did. But when he worked with them, when he sent them out to ministry, they were equipped for the task. It wasn't easy. There were some challenges out there, but they were equipped to deal with it. And so it says here, there is no room. Look at here. There is no room for laziness in the church of Christ. Christ expects every believer, Christ expects every believer to labor for him. For him. Not for the pastor, not for this person, not for whatever reasons. And that's where we get messed up because we think, I ain't doing this for him. They ask me, I ain't doing that for them. I'm not doing that. You're not, you ain't supposed to, you're right. You shouldn't be doing it. You should be doing it for God first. See, to empower the church, 
of Christ, the church of God, God's house, you should be doing it as unto him first. But you look at a man and you look at things from the natural perspective or the person or whatever, and you say, well, I'm not doing it. Or I'm not getting paid. They ain't paying me to do nothing, you know? And God says, I'll supply your every need according to my riches and glory. And so what you're doing, the one that's able to take care of every one of your needs, the one that's able to heal your body, the one that's able to bring joy when there's no joy in your life, the one that's able to do those things in your life, then that's the one, what you're telling, you're telling him, I ain't doing nothing, I ain't getting paid for it, but you are getting paid. He wake you up in the morning. He takes care of your bills. He gives you money to get up. He gives you money. He gives you your health and strength to get up, to go out and make the money. But you come in here, and then you'll say, because you're looking at things from a natural perspective, you're like, I ain't going to do that. So you take it personal. And so that's why it says there is no room for laziness in the church of Christ. Christ expects every. He didn't say some. He didn't say, oh, just get three or four out of here. He expects every believer to labor for him. To labor to the point of exhaustion. Note that Christ keeps a count. Look at here, see, not me. See, Christ, note that Christ keeps a account of our work and labor. He keeps an account. That's why when Paul and Timothy, when Paul's time came for the end of his departure, the end of his labor here on earth, Paul said, I've done. This is what I've done. And I kept the faith. And he said, what is stored up for me is crowns of righteousness. See, what God, when it went into God's account, can't no one take it out. Ain't no IRS or no one can deal with it. They can't touch that. But when it goes into the natural, when you deposit it into your a natural account, then them things are taken away from you because they are vanity. They're like Solomon said, it's like chasing after the wind. So you go around and you're like, well, you know what? Uh, Sister Ardeen asked me to, could I help do this or that in the church? I ain't doing nothing. She had the nerves to ask me. I ain't doing, they ain't paying me to do that. Well, God said, you're laboring for him. So you got your perspectives wrong. You're supposed to be doing it as unto God. The one that's a, the one that wake you up in the morning, that, that same God, that's the one that woke you up that you saying, I ain't going to do this. The one that give you the strength to get up and go to that job that you're going to take all this mess from, these people. Yeah, he's paying you. So it says, it says, he knows when we become tired and exhausted and can go no more. He knows, God knows. He also knows when we should be working and do not. He knows. You think God don't know? We can pretend all we want. God knows when what we should be doing it even and when we're not doing it. When we try to disguise and act like, oh, I'm doing this and that, God knows. He sees everything. That's the one person that you can't hide nothing from. Because it's going to be a time where they try to hide up under rocks and they can't even hide there. It's not going to work. It says, for I was hungered. Look at here. Matthew 25, 35 through 36, verse 35 and 6. He says, for I was hungered and you gave me meat. Who gave me meat? God. He said, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came on to me. God is able to meet you in all those places. He met the needs in every one of those places. The same God that sometimes we say, I ain't doing this. 
because God sends someone else because he said, understand this, he said, a body I need. A body that I need. I have to send back to the Father, but you have to be here for a season. Whatever your season is, you have a work to do here for the glory of God. You're doing the work for me. You're laboring for me because one day you're going to check out of here and better make sure when you check out you have something in your account, your heavenly account, because we check out of here and we step into eternity. You see? And so he's the same one that when I'm hungry, I was hungry, and I prayed, and I was like, man, Lord, can you help or, I'm, you know, help? And then God sent help. He'll send someone to feed me or to buy me food or whatever. God will meet that need. He said, and he, and he gave me meat. See, and he gave me meat. He said, I was thirsty. And what? And you gave me something to drink. He said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. I was a stranger. I was a, even when I was a stranger, he said, and he took me in. He delivered me out of darkness into his wonderful light. And I was a stranger because I was about out here. And he still took me in because he died for the sins of the world. Naked, and he clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. All of us has been in some of those places. One of us, every one of us, fit in one of these categories. I don't care who we are. I don't care how much money you got. You say, well, I've had money and I had everything. I, but you fit in one of them categories, I guarantee you. You might have not been hungry. You might have not needed for him to give you meat. You might have not been thirsty. But you definitely was a stranger. And if you wasn't a stranger and then you were sick and you asked him to visit you, something happened where you had to call on God. That's why he says in Matthew 5 and 16, he says, we have an obligation. Let your light shine before men. God says, let your light shine before men. Why do you want my light to shine before this world, God? That they may see your good works. Just so they can see my good works? Why just to see my good works, Lord? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. See? Because we are representatives of God. He's called us to a higher calling. And what is a higher calling? We can't go to a higher calling if we're living just like the world. If we're acting, talking, doing everything that they do. We can't. There is no higher calling. Because we want to stay down here. Because it's comfortable down here. It's comfortable when I can be down here and I can fit in with everybody. I fit in because then I ain't got to worry about, you know, I can just go to church on Sunday and I can talk about how good God is and then I'm, but I'm going to keep quiet and I'm going to not get involved with anything and so there won't be no, but it's still a light on you because God sees everything. And then it says number two. Look at the church here in Revelations, the second chapter, verse two and three. That, the church, it says the church patiently endured. They patiently endured. The word means to patiently endure. The word means to per persevere and to be steadfast in serving Christ and in standing against all the temptations and trials of life. The church was stood fast in studying and proclaiming the gospel and in ministering to the needs and in ministering to the needs of the needy. They endured in those things. And those things come at a cost. It come at a cost 
And why do you say it come at a cost? Because now we're in the world, but we're not part of the world because those things, when we're doing those things like that, it takes us from the joy that the world has for us, the things that the world has for us because we don't have time for them because we're about our father's business. And so we start not to fit in with those things. And so now what happens is that we have to make a decision. Am I going to enjoy the benefits here on earth? Or am I going to wait and enjoy the benefits here in heaven? Therefore, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. You hear that, Brother Ed? It's not in vain. In the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. James 1, chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. My brethren. He says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your fate work at patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That you may. These things that we go through, they're never to make us bitter. The things that God allow, allow us to go through. See, the devil can't force them on us. God allows us to go through some of the things, but the things that he allow us to go through, they're never to make us bitter. There's to make us better, a lot stronger. And you look in the Bible and you see some of the people in the Bible and some of the tough things that they had to go through and they had to endure. Those things made them better. Always made them better. Even Peter in denying Christ three times. But before he denied Christ, look at here. We're not perfect, but look at here right here. Before Peter denied Christ and before Christ told him that look what took place before see we don't think about what was taking place before see Christ Peter sat and spent time with the Lord there was a relationship a strong bond being built and Peter had a closeness with the Lord. He was so close to him that he knew that I would never deny you, Lord. He knew that I died for you, Lord. And he meant what he said. He wasn't just throwing out words. He meant everything he said, but he, God knew it was going to come a time where he was going to deny him. But God knew that even though Peter was going to deny me, Peter, after he denied me, Peter was going to be convicted in his heart. And that conviction was going to cause Peter to not always just stay bitter, but become better. That conviction that Peter had, even in denying Christ, caused him to become a more powerful man of God. Why? Because of that relationship. See, we missed the relationship that God was building with him. Jesus was working with him, spending time with him, even though it came to a point where what Peter thought he was able to do, he couldn't do. But then it came a time where he was able to do. You see, because he was godly sorrow. And he said, godly sorrow work at repentance. And he repented, changed his way, and got back on the battlefield for the Lord. Number three, the, the church could not bear those who were evil. They couldn't, they couldn't bear with those. They wouldn't allow the people to come in and just treat any kind of people any kind of way. They had a standard. 
and you just wouldn't come in and hear disrupting stuff. And sometimes we allow, for whatever reasons, people to come in and they think they can do anything they want to do and treat a person any kind of way they want to treat them, and they don't expect you to say anything. Because maybe they pay a lot or they give a lot of money or whatever it is. But they wouldn't allow in that. They said the church could not bear those who were evil. This refers to sin and evil. Men who were corrupt and polluted and who live for two for who live for the world instead of living for God. People like that were in the church. Living for the world instead of living for God. Because they wanted the immediate they wanted uh how would you say? They wanted right now things. I want money now. I want whatever I can get now. I want the pleasures here on earth right now. I want all these things right now. Now I want to go to heaven, but I want all these things. So because I want these things so much, I'm willing to compromise because I want those things so much. And it says, so it refers to Sin, evil, men who were corrupt and polluted and who lived for the world instead of living for God. The church could not tolerate the sin and shame, dirt and pollution, filth and destruction of evil. They couldn't tolerate it. They could not tolerate those things. They, in other words, they wasn't going to put up with it. They were going to call you on it. If you were coming in here with that type of attitude, they were going to call you. If you were just about yourself and about what you can get coming in here, what you can get for myself, they wasn't going to put up with it. Bless, because it says Matthew 5 and 8, bless are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Wherefore, come out from among them. It says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. And then last, it says number four, the church tested all the, the church tested all the preachers and teachers of the church and rejected the false. In other words, they didn't allow someone to walk in the church Sometimes we allow people to come in because they look a certain way. They have the education behind their background. They have all of this. I have doctor this and stuff. They preach good. They sound good. All of that right there, and we allow them to come in. And the Bible says test the spirit and see if it's of God. The Bible says you'll know the tree by the fruit that it bear, but you won't know the tree if you just allow the tree to be planted in here and then start doing what it wants to do. See, what they watch and they continue to watch and there was a time and a season because God did not, Jesus set that example. He just didn't call the disciples and call them into ministry and then say, go. See, he taught them. He spent time with them. He got to know them first and so just because a person walk in here and say oh I'm a, I'm a pastor I'm an evangelist I'm this I'm that and I'm all these things it don't mean that he's getting up there and don't mean that he's going to teach God's people because the pastor has an obligation to know something about that person so you do all those things when can you spend time with me when can you come in here and when can we sit and we talk and we can spend see how often you come see what you're doing when you come We've had some say they pastors, 
but they don't show up because of what? Natural circumstances. They can't come. Exactly. It says, so wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and, and, and touch not the unclean thing. So the church, and so the church tested all the preachers and teachers of the church and rejected the false. They rejected the false ones. The false ones, uh-uh, you're not fitting to get up here because if I allow you to get up here, what you're going to cause? You're going to cause division. That's it. That's, the only, that's your purpose. You're coming here not to do this, to bring things together, but you're coming here to tear things up, and we're not going to allow it. So they were stud fast in those areas right there, very stud fast in those areas. They didn't allow just anyone to get up and say anything because you're not going to come here and just say anything that you want to say. God, it doesn't work like that. It says, if a teacher confessed that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had come into the flesh, he was accepted and allowed to teach if he denied that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh, he was not allowed to teach. The church could not tolerate false teachers and stood against all false teaching. They were loyal to Christ. See, there was a relationship. They were loyal, not to me first, but they were loyal to Christ. Because if you're loyal to Christ, then God will convict your heart about the things you need to do. If you're loyal to man and you're loyal to your flesh first, then you're going to follow the flesh. But if you're loyal to Christ, like I say, for instance, mother, how long you been doing what you've been doing in the church? A long time, right? So, but she's loyal to Christ first because there's people, and I can tell you, and I'll say this, I know, there's people within all that time that then cause havoc in her life, that then said they got upset and all of that. But if you're not loyal to God, then you're going to say, I'm not doing nothing for these people. I'm not helping them. I'm not doing, but you're not doing it. You're doing it for the glory of God. That's who you're doing it. Jesus came to the earth, and even though he was tested in areas, he said, I'm about my father's business. I ain't coming here. I'm not coming here to be about my business. I'm coming here to be about my father's business. And when I'm about my father's business, that's the thing we got to understand. When we're about our father's business, then he'll take care of ours. That's why they wouldn't tolerate. They wouldn't tolerate no nonsense. They ain't going to allow nobody to come in here and cause no division because whatever their reason is, you're not going to come because this is not a place to where you can come and you can bring your mess. See, the church ain't for that. The church is for healing. It's not for bringing. This is not a, 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 a junkyard where you bring all your junk. And I just want to hear, I want to come, and I want to bring my junk, and I want to stand before everybody and give everyone my junk. That ain't what the church is for. The church is for healing. If you got junk on you, then you need for God to help you. I can tell you what he can do to help you. Right. But if you just want to pour poison, the church it ain't about poison because ain't no poison in heaven. See, it ain't none of those things in heaven. And he said, let what's in heaven be done here on earth. See, and that's why he gives us something so precious. His word. That's what he gives us. A solid foundation. And so, last of all, I'm going to read here, and I, yeah, I think I have time to finish number five. It says, beloved, believers, believers not every, uh, be, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know you the spirit of God, every spirit spirit that confess that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confess not that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. It's already in the world. Because look around the world. 
Just look how things are going in the world right now. Look at what's being accepted. Look at the things that we as believers are putting up with and accepting. We are accepting things that the world is throwing up on us and we're saying it's okay. And God is probably looking and saying, you cowards, you know, because you have to be cowards if we're putting up with it because he said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. God didn't build no cowards. God built mighty men of God. That's why I said, uh, uh, Peter, what we don't understand, and I was talking about it earlier, Peter had, we talk about how Peter, God told Peter, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times. But look at here, the beauty in the denying him three times. Jesus knew that this young man was going to deny me. He didn't think that he would ever deny Christ. He said, I'm going to die for him. I die, and he meant every word he said. But see, Peter didn't know what was in him. God knew what was in him. But God is not to make us bitter. He's to make us better. That's why Jesus wants to build a foundation with us first. So what he did with Peter, he built a relationship with him. He spent time with him. He worked with him. That's why Paul said, I want to know him in the power that's in his resurrection. So when when he got to this point and then Peter denied Christ and Peter, people probably talked about Peter in the church. Oh, look at him. Look what he did. He denied and he spent all this time with him and he did this and that. You know how people talk and they went, oh, he think he's a Christian. He think he's that. They got the audacity to do things like that. But what he didn't know, this man was spending time with all you're doing is looking and talking and running your mouth and you don't know what this person is doing. And because Peter had spent time and he had a relationship when they told him and he they God allowed someone to speak to him, Peter went away and he was convicted in his heart. He was so convicted in his heart that he repented and then look at here, the work he did later. He did a mighty work and the things where he feared in before he didn't fear in no more. He didn't even, even fear death. You see? And so our God, that's what he wants. All of it. Yeah. And last of all, I'm not going to be able to finish this, I don't think. But the last point, because we're on a time. And when you're, on a, and I'll say this right here. Now, that's something that we have to understand too. God is a God of perfect order. And so, say for instance, if we're in the church and we have things has done a certain way and it's done an orderly way it has to be done orderly it can't be done even though you know I went over maybe three or four minutes and it seems like nothing but it is something because we're on a time thing we're on time and we should be when people walk in here we should be orderly when people walk in here, our music, everything, our music department, everything should be because it should be done for the glory of God. And so when people walk in here, we should shine. He says, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father. And so God is a God of perfect order. He's not a God of disorder. He's a God of perfect order. And so what we have to learn through covenant relationship we have to learn God's perfect order so no I would like to go over till 1030 but no I can't because there's an order and God says when you step past it you out of order because the pastor has I put him in this position and he has said this is the way I want things ran and this is the way I need to do it you see what I'm saying but we ain't going to get into that No, it's in God's timing. Yeah, that's why it's, it says it's in very important. Last of all, and I'm going to just read this. I'm not going to be able to talk about it. We'll go back to it next week, so I'm going to leave you with this. It says, number five, and mother, we are in uh, Revelations, the second chapter, verse two and three. It says, the church bore up, bore up under all the... Oh, under all for the sake of Christ's name. This is 
a descriptive verse, the description that touches the hearts of tender believers, the church bore up patiently. Listen here. The church bore up because they had a relationship with Christ. What they did, they did for Christ. That's why when we walk in, if we walk in and things are so out of order and stuff and we think we can get up and just do anything and we allow it, that's not God's order because it's not helping anyone out there. And so that's why they understood that and they bore up, they patiently endured, they labored, they did not faint. Why? For Christ's name's sake, they did it all and bore so much for Christ's sake, they worked, hard, they worked and toiled to the point of exhaustion. They patiently endured they did not bear, bear or put up with evil. They did not bear or put up with evil. They tested and rejected false prophets. They tested and rejected false prophets. We have to know something about the person that we allow to come in here, especially teaching or stand, and these are God's people, and we, when we allow anyone to come in here because they sound good, look good, they can get the crowd going and all of that, and we know nothing about their life, we putting ourselves in a danger zone. Because God has not said, this isn't the way you do it. God is a God of order. That's why I'll finish here. When God called his disciples, when God called them, he didn't call them like we do in the church. We get somebody, we call them, we put them to work. It doesn't work like that. We get them, we call them. If they say they have a call, we teach them. We spend time with their mother. We get to know something about that person. I have to know something. It have to be some kind of bond built. And if it's nothing built and I just allow you to get up here and speak to God's people, God's going to hold me accountable because I don't know what you're capable of saying and I don't know your behavior. I don't know nothing about you. And we have to know something about one another. That's where relationship comes. And that's why Paul was so adamant when he said nothing else matters no more because Paul, we know, he had education. He had everything. He had fame. He had all those things. But he said nothing else matters now but to know him and the power that's in his resurrection and the fellowship that's in his suffering. I need to know those things right there because that's what's going to get me through life in a victorious way. Father, I just thank you for this lesson, Heavenly Father. I thank you that it didn't fall on deaf ears, Father God, but I thank you, Heavenly Father, that it accomplished everything that you would have it to accomplish according to your good and perfect will, Father God. Though we're not perfect, Father God, no one up under the sound of my voice, I pray, Father God, that we just have more of a heart, Father God, to do what is pleasing and acceptable in your sight, Father God. If we seek first the kingdom of God, that's your word and your righteousness, then we won't lack in any area, oh God. So I thank you, we love you, and we give you the glory that you so rightfully deserve in the name that's above every name. And at the name of Jesus, let his wonderful people say, amen.